big thanks to my Patreon supporters. Got a new lab bench. It's much better than the concrete stairwell I was using before. Has a couple superficial additions that I don't need, but those can always be taken off. I believe this is a soup can opener, or a can opener. And have I got a can to open. We got some Campbell's tomato soup right here. Never have been quite fond of soups that have no texture to them. Just water and tomato doesn't really doesn't really seem like it would taste that well. Then again, I've never had tomato soup. Would you look at that? It worked. I am inclined to believe that somewhere that tomato soup can found its piece. So today we are going to be making isocyanogen tetraazide, or otherwise known as azetoazide azide. Compared to the other steps in this synthesis shown in earlier videos, this is by far the easiest step. However, it does have the highest level of danger. This is because we are concentrating 14 nitrogen atoms onto two carbon atoms. Nature really wouldn't want that to happen, so we're going to have some preventative measures to keep the tetraazide from us and kind of distance ourselves from any potential detonation. One way we're going to do that is to only use plastic to house the reaction as it's taking place. In my case, I'm using one of these pear-shaped ampules that's made out of plastic. Now, like I've said in some recent videos, I'm not giving exact measurements, but I am following the same exact procedure that Engager listed and is right up on energetic derivatives of tetrazoles. That's linked down below. First, we're going to need a little bit of sodium azide. If you're not familiar with sodium azide, it's sort of a bad boy chemical. First of all, it's toxic as cyanides. Second, when it decomposes, it releases 1.5 moles of nitrogen gas and one mole of burning sodium metal. Anyway, we dissolve our sodium azide in some water and then we add that to our pear-shaped ampule. Then we start rapidly stirring it with a stir bar while it's cooling down. Now we crack open the ampule of isocyanogen tetrabromide that we sealed up last video. Once the hole in the ampule is big enough that we can fit a pipette through, we do a little maneuver called the squirt and suck where we squirt in some acetone and then suck out the dissolved isocyanogen tetrabromide dissolved in the acetone. Now we slowly pipette the isocyanogen tetrabromide solution into our solution of sodium azide stirring. This is where we quickly see a change in color from a yellowish color of the isocyanogen tetrabromide solution to a red color, which I can only assume is free bromine. Now I add some more ice and wait a half an hour for the reaction to take place. When we come back, we see there's a red slurry of precipitate. The solution has also turned a lighter color. At this point, we add an excess of water to precipitate out our final product. The white isocyanogen tetraazide settles to the bottom of the pear-shaped vessel. We can carefully pipette it out to place it on some filter paper with some paper towels underneath to absorb most of the water. Now, although this entire reaction was done outside underneath an umbrella, there was enough UV to discolor the product. I found this discoloration had zero impact on the power or sensitivity of the energetic. Even when I exposed a small portion to several hours of direct sunlight, the sample performed the same as the unexposed product. When I put some crystals of the isocyanogen tetraazide under a microscope, they looked beautiful. Now you can throw any crystals under a microscope and they're going to look real nice and pretty, but you got to remember that these are like 89% nitrogen by weight. It's just crazy to think that there's so much nitrogen in there and it can all be released all at once. Now let's actually talk about the power of this energetic. Isocyanogen tetraazide is by far the most powerful energetic I've ever worked with. It blows everything else out of the water. Bisdiazotetrazoleal hydrazine has nothing on it. We put it on the foil and the tiniest bits just shred the foil, put some on a can, it'll dent the can every single time no matter how much you put on it. 
and then when we actually do a can test with it, 30 milligrams destroys the can. And it actually rips off bits of aluminum in chunks rather than just bending it backwards. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. In both friction and shock tests, the compound performs nearly identical to bisdiazotetrazoleal hydrazine. However, when it's heated from underneath, it actually melts, then boils, and then detonates. What's very interesting to see is after detonation, a large cloud of soot is produced. This is indicative of zero oxygen present in the molecule, exactly what we would expect from C2 and 14. Just like we precipitated the product out of acetone, we can redissolve it back into acetone to form a lacquer that is highly explosive. This is very similar to sodium nitrotetrazole in acetone, however it's much more powerful. All in all, I only produced 70 milligrams of the compound. 10 milligrams of the compound I have dissolved in acetone for the purpose of hopefully later being able to do Raymond spectroscopy on the compound. I will keep you guys updated if or when that ever gets done.